Welcome to the SIBO Doctor Podcast with Dr. Narala Jacoby, a US-trained naturopathic physician and medical director of the SIBO Doctor, an online education resource for practitioners. This podcast is intended for SIBO treating practitioners and aims to help educate how we may best serve our SIBO patients. Medical experts join us to discuss functional digestive disorders, clinical practice, and research as it relates to SIBO and associated conditions. Head over to thecebodoctor.com where you can learn everything about SIBO from the basics to advanced treatments. You can also join in the conversation on the SIBO Doctor Practitioner Forum Facebook group. If you're a patient, please note this information is not intended to diagnose or treat medical conditions. Please ask your doctor before initiating any new treatments. We welcome you to head over to the SIBO Lifestyle Facebook group, where we post frequent tips and videos to help you on the road to gut health recovery. And now, over to Dr. Jacoby and the SIBO Doctor podcast. Welcome, SIBO Doctor practitioners, to another episode of the SIBO Doctor podcast. I'm with Dr. Laura Bryden, who's a naturopathic doctor and period revolutionary. Laura is passionate about communication about women's health and alternatives to hormonal birth control. Her book, Period Repair Manual, is a manifesto of natural treatment for better hormones and better periods and provides practical solutions using nutrition, supplements, and natural hormones. She's been in practice for over 20 years. She's a naturopathic doctor. So really what we're going to be talking about today um, is endometriosis and its connection to SIBO. And many of you have heard me talk about the four different categories of underlying causes as to why someone might get SIBO. And endometriosis is right there at the top of the list because of its issues around adhesion formation. So welcome, Dr. Bryden. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Bryden is actually in New Zealand, so we're having all sorts of technical issues. So hopefully we can uh, we can uh, repair this as we go along. So, Dr. Bryden, first of all, how did you get into this field of women's health issues and hormones? Well, I started out in more general practice, but I'd say all you know, close to twenty years ago, I started focusing more on women's health, women's hormones. It was mainly based on my patient base, women who were coming to me for help with periods, um, PCOS, endometriosis, perimenopause, and I treat some thyroid as well. And that just became my focus. And then as you say, about four or five years ago, I put that all into a book called Period Repair Manual, which has been really great to be able to communicate that with the world, to be able to communicate that these kinds of natural treatments can make a big difference for period health. Mm, wonderful. And, you know, when it comes to endometriosis, there are some of us in the SIBO world that um, think that endometriosis is really a hidden um, condition, that many people overlook this as an underlying cause of SIBO. But before we really dive into that topic, can you just give us sort of an overview of what endometriosis really is? Endometriosis is an inflammatory disease. I think that just needs to be stated. It's not a hormonal problem. It's an active inflammatory disease, primarily of immune dysfunction, that is involves inflammatory lesions, usually throughout the pelvis, but they can actually occur anywhere in the body, that will become inflamed, sort of cycle through the, the, the month with the natural ups and downs of hormones. And they can be quite destructive. They cause pain. They can cause tissue damage. They cause scarring and adhesions, which you mentioned earlier. So, of course, that can damage the gut, affect the gut. And um, in endometriosis can cause infertility as well, just from this, the presence of the inflammation, the scarring, sometimes just the anatomical blockage from the lesions of the tubes. Mm. So on a monthly basis, um, and we, we often see young women with this condition, um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I remember, and I, I mean, I used to do a lot of women's health before I moved to Australia also, uh, because it's so, uh, common period disorders and, 
period dysphoria and all those kinds of issues that women face. But endometriosis really is quite different than just, let's say, estrogen dominance, although, of course, we, we see that often with endometriosis. But one of the issues there is um, scar formation and adhesion. So can you tell us how that actually occurs? The, the scar, the adhesions form just from the inflammatory tissue damage from the disease and also sometimes from surgeries that are used to try to treat the disease, to excise the lesions that can cause its own scar tissue. But I'd like to just zoom out a little bit, actually, and talk about the relationship between gut problems and endometriosis because they're highly correlated. I just wrote a little a sort of um, literature review about this, where some of the studies were finding, you know, up to 90%, 9-0 of endometriosis patients have irritable bowel or some manifestation of bowel problems. So there's an incredible amount of overlap. And I just want to say at the outset, th there's a few reasons for that. I mean, I think there is um, overlap in symptoms. So sometimes clinicians aren't going to know is the pain from the gut or from, the, from endometriosis lesions. So one can be misdiagnosed for the other. Then there's what you're talking about. Damage from the endometriosis can affect the bowel and lead to things like SIBO. And then there's the, the other direction as well, which is that issues in the bowel can drive or worsen endometriosis itself. And that's, that's an angle that I, a lot of my writing has been about that, looking at ways to treat the gut to help endometriosis in that direction. That's fascinating. Can you can you talk a bit more about what you're finding with what the underlying drivers in terms of gut issues might involve when it comes to endometriosis? Yeah. So there's a couple things to. to I'm just going to jump straight to the really yeah, juicy, let's juicy right, bits. Let's get <laughs> right into the, it. That's good. The really juicy bits. So there's two things as clinicians to have on your radar. One is something called the microbial hypothesis of endometriosis, which is pretty new in the research, but there have been a few studies so far. Basically, what they're looking at is the high prevalence of gram-negative bacteria and LPS lipopolysaccharide within the pelvis, the pelvic cavity of women with endometriosis. And most of the research that's finding that is, is saying that it's probably coming from translocation from the gut, i.e., gut permeability, intestinal wow. permeability, the gut, the, the toxins, the bacterial toxins are, are leaking out into the pelvis. This is already a pelvis. This is already a place where there are inflammatory lesions present and an immune system that is very primed to inflammatory disease, it's an inflammatory condition. And so that combination, in fact, we know from some of the research that the combination of LPS plus the presence of estradiol, estradiol, plus the, a certain haplotype, like the immune, kind of autoimmune haplotype, that is a perfect storm for endometriosis lesions. And so that potentially gives us a way to intervene is if we can reduce, we can't change someone's genotype and we can't change the fact that there's estrogen present, but we can potentially reduce the presence of those microbes through by, you know, improving leaky gut, basically, and your um, gut permeability. So that's one. That's called the microbial hypothesis. I might just jump straight to the other one, and then we mm -hmm. can look at mm -hmm. the two. But this, I just shared something on my Instagram yesterday. I don't know when this podcast is going to come out, but this is kind of new on my radar. So I'm mentioning this to you and love to get your feedback. I have just come across this fascinating study out of Italy, brand new, at the end of January 2020, where they, it was a clinical trial, a trial study, a pilot study, where they um, took women with confirmed endometriosis plus gut symptoms, which are pretty easy to find because that's, like I said, there's a 90% overlap. And they screened them for nickel allergy. And then they put them on a low nickel diet. Now, I was not aware that nickel allergy has actually been correlated with irritable bowel syndrome or IBS already. And so now this is a you know potential additional piece of information. Basically, I think what the idea is that people nickel allergy is about ten percent of the population, and it causes a allergic dermatitis or inflammation with contact at the skin. And what they're saying is that um, you know there's also some foods that are quite high in nickel, and that's quite irritating 
for the gut. It's not exactly on the topic of SIBO, but it's still like a gut, a gut reaction. And they found that of these endometriosis, endometriosis sufferers that they tested, 90% of them had a nickel allergy. So I posted this. I mean, I heard, I got a little comment back from Rachel Arthur, who I know you know, and another Australian naturopath. And she said, yeah, nickel allergy is involved in a few things. And so I thought this was, yeah, potentially quite interesting. Had you heard of that before? I haven't really heard about the, the IBS connection, but uh, I do have a number of uh, people who do have, and I myself have a, have a nickel sensitivity to in jewelry yeah. and stuff. Yeah. But the people that are like always showing up on, you know, if we, if, if we do a, a heavy metal assessment that do have nickel, high nickel, um, I often, you know, like I, I when I last researched this a few years ago, um, apparently also stainless steel cookware is quite high in nickel. So, um, so that's always, that's the only thing I, I remember from that conversation, but I haven't had anyone, uh, but I haven't asked about yeah. nickel allergy, you know? So, yeah. so it's yeah. different, it's different than a toxicity. I don't think the idea is that the levels are at a toxic level. It's that it's, it's an immune system that is for some reason primed reacting to the presence of nickel. Uh, well, we can put the, this in the show notes, if you want this, this study in your, um, your yeah, no, that'd be really good it. because, yeah. So what are they saying is the driver of nickel causing endometriosis inflammation? Yeah. Well, I think it's inflammation. They, I did read the whole paper yesterday. Yeah. They, they don't, they don't know, of course, it's a small study, but I guess just to circle back to what I'm talking about, about inflammation in the gut or potentially LPS, toxins as an mm -hmm. example of an inflammatory substance from the gut, influencing the immune system throughout the pelvis that aggravates or worsens this disease, which is an inflammatory disease, a disease of immune dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that, I, I, I'm just kind of blown away that they would find um, gram negative bacteria with, yeah. within the pelvic cavity, which to me would be almost like peritonitis or something, No, you know, but, and even the, the mechanism of leaky gut, I just can't fathom how it would end up in the pelvic cavity and not in just circulation, you know? So that's really well, it, fascinating. Well, it goes into the blood as well, but mm. just to be clear, I mean, the, the pelvis, the pelvic cavity has a microbiome, mm. right? Like we have a microbiome almost everywhere, right? So, but in the peritoneal cavity, like in within, like we know about the vaginal and and I'm, I'm assuming uterine areas. Yeah, um, and I guess they're open to the pelvic cavity. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. and so, so bacteria would just be translocated, maybe even with retrograde menstruation, if that's still on the radar for a possible etiology for endometriosis. Is that still um, it is. I suspect, I suspect, so that, that goes back to the question of where, how do the lesions get mm -hmm. there, the endometrious lesions get there. And retrograde menstruation was always the leading theory. I, of course, that has been challenged um, it, from a, num a number of ways. I suspect, I suspect what it is, and I've heard a few people say this, I suspect there are different ways that the lesions can get there, whether they're laid down embryologically, whether they're carried... Um, you know, by the lymphatic system or actually I, I, on the, staying on the topic of the microbiome and endometriosis, there's a, a microbiologist in Sydney. I've forgotten her name now. You should, might, she might be a good guest to have on here on your show is like a part two of this, but they've just done a study of um, microbiome and endometriosis. And she said to me that some aspects of endometriosis as a disease, it behaves like a microbial disease, like the distribution of the lesions looks potentially like microbes have been involved with that, which is pretty fascinating. And in this research about the microbial hypothesis, it was not subtle. Like the levels of LPS toxin in the pelvic cavity of women with endometriosis was six times higher wow. than women without. And it was showing mm -hmm. up in the menstrual fluid as well. Mm -hmm. so, wow. That's yeah. significant, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I have yeah. to say that retrospectively, you know, when I think back, uh, of my endometriosis patients, I, I, I can't think of a single one really that didn't have IBS type symptoms, you know? So, so that definitely fits with that, um, theory also. Well, in neurology, we know that, for example, there's been a, a New Zealand 
clinical trial a few years ago where they trialed a low FODMAP diet for, again, for that patient group who have both IBS and endometriosis, which is a huge group. And they found that it improved improved their symptoms, but not just of the IBS, but of the endometriosis as well. So already you're getting another angle. Yes, as soon as you start to improve things in the gut, that can help to relieve the endometriosis symptoms as well. And also vice versa. Yes, you know, preventing um, adhesions is potentially going to, you know, help to the gut. But I would say that that direction of gut to endo is the bigger one that we should be paying attention to as clinicians, because there's so many things we can do for the gut directly. One of the other aspects of that, and this, this maybe goes back 20 years when we first started to look at the um, estrogen metabolites and um, the theory of estrogen dominance, maybe not theory, but the, the issue of estrogen dominance when it came, came to most uh, hormonal issues but as they pertain to women. Is that, still, is that still a theory or is that still something you work with, with uh, just clearing estrogen or improving estrogen metabolism? So let's talk about that. So that's the, it has a name now, it's called the estrobolome. Estrobolome, so, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the part of the microbiome. The bacteria, or the ba- more about the um, the enzymes of the bacteria. Yes. I've, I've heard a lot of things about the microbiome. We need to just speak more in terms of their enzyme content than their species, because you know it, it, that's what really matters at the end of the day. So those bacteria who are metabolizing estrogen, or who are conversely not metabolizing it, because they're making a lot of um, beta beta glucuronidase, the enzyme that recirculates estrogen, without a doubt that. A problem with the gut and the microbiome can raise estrogen levels, and that can contribute to estrogen excess. I actually, just for what it's worth, I do not use the term estrogen dominance. And I know a lot of clinicians do, and I'm not anti it. I'm not totally anti it. It's just that I feel it's not as precise as speaking about it in other ways. So estrogen excess is a helpful term. I think progesterone deficiency is a helpful term. That's a whole other, you know, that's anovulatory cycles. That's a a whole other kind of conversation. And then just to to be clear with endometriosis, it is not caused by estrogen dominance. It is not. I would say most of my patients with endometriosis have normal hormones. So they're not it's two, it's two things can be true at the same time, right? The, the disease process, the inflammatory disease process of endometriosis is very much flared up by estrogen. But that doesn't mean that estrogen is the cause of that. And in fact, when the disease is present, even a normal amount of estrogen is worsens the disease. So yes, you know, from a conventional medicine point of view, they take one of their strategies is to shut off estrogen. But that is a problem because we need estrogen. Actually, you can't, you know, that's not a solution to an inflammatory disease. My solution, of course, as an ND looking upstream, getting, trying to get to the root cause is if the, if the problem is chronic inflammation and like pretty significant immune dysfunction, almost autoimmune type immune dysfunction, and some of the drivers of that, namely lipopolysaccharides and intestinal permeability, then you want to treat those things, right? You want to stabilize the immune system. And then a woman can have her own ups and downs of estrogen and not suffer aggravations from that. This is kind of maybe ties back to uh, this this issue around endometriosis that the extent of lesions doesn't really predict the amount of symptoms, right? So you can have somebody who is, they go in with a laparos- um, laparoscopy and they are, they have a massive amount of, of intraperitoneal or, or lesions. And that doesn't naturally, doesn't actually predict the level of symptomatology. And then you can have somebody who barely has anything and they're in tremendous pain and have a lot of issues. So that I always found really fascinating. So what, what's the drive? What, how do you explain that? Yeah. A lot of it's to do with the level of inflammation and the involvement of the nervous system. So here's something quite interesting that a lot of people don't know. So you know, yes, and okay, we, so just to back up a little bit, you know, we think okay, endometriosis lesions are endometrial tissue 
or tissue that is like the endometrium or the uterine lining that is located in places that is not, in, not inside the uterus, so in the wrong locations. But there's some big differences. It's only endometrial lesions are only like endometrial lining. They're different in some ways. And one big difference is the endometrial lining does not have a nerve supply. This is my understanding. Whereas endometriosis lesions can be heavily innervated. So depending on, and those like those pain type nerves that and um, P factor and all the different kind of pain signaling that gets set up with those lesions is obviously going to di directly correlate with the pain experienced. And just to differentiate again, that's different from normal endometrial tissue, which is does not have pain receptors or innervation. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, it, it's, there is similarities with autoimmune disease in the way those endometriosis lesions become invasive, you know, grow their own nerve supply. There's different growth factors happening that, you know, stimulating them in ways that is not normal for tissue. So, mm. yeah. So, you know, before we go into what kinds of treatments you would do and how you really approach it, um, do, you know... Well, how, you mentioned something about birth control pills and and you and the whole book. I guess the premise of your book is to get people sort of also away from birth control pill. Can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, with regard into well, okay. Yeah, go. with yeah, well, yeah. you know, I mean, I guess in general, also, yes. I mean, I have my own issues when it comes to. I mean, my thought about birth control pill is different, maybe from yours, from a gut perspective, because of the things it does in the gut and how it can promote yeast overgrowth and things like that. Um, that may be different from from your approach. Okay, my my basic premise is this: that it is an outdated technology that when the pill those I don't the contraceptive drugs were invented before there was any real understanding of the menstrual cycle and so we're using these very heavy hitting drugs for a situation that requires a lot more subtlety so just and and the language around it has been very strange so just to give the most basic example women are told still told today that the pill can regulate their hormones mm -hmm. or regulate their menstrual cycle when in actual fact, what the contraceptive drugs do is shut down completely the menstrual cycle and induce what is really best described as a temporary chemical menopause with the kind of give back of replacement of these contraceptive drugs, which are not even as good as the hormones that are given to women in menopause now. So they're substandard. They're not hormones. They're called hormones, but they're not. Like, for example, the main progestin that's used is a drug called levengestrol, which is like only slightly similar to progesterone, which is actually more, it's actually more similar to testosterone than it is to progesterone, which is why levengestrol, that drug, that progestin drug causes hair loss whereas progesterone is quite beneficial for hair. Here's another example. Progestins potentially do bad things to the immune system, I would say, potentially, whereas progesterone is a beneficial immune modulator. That's one of its main benefits, actually. So we've been in this situation. It's only 60 years old, 60 years ago, when we started putting women on the pill. Back then it was only, you know, take the pill between babies, take it for a few years. That probably wasn't too bad. But now we've progressed to this time where it's like, as soon as you start having periods, shut it all down with these drugs and take these, you know, be, take these contraceptive drugs instead of your hormones for decades. Mm -hmm. And obviously to me, it's very much an emperor's new clothes situation of what have we been doing? This is coming at it from the perspective where, I actually feel like women's own hormones are, have, are quite beneficial and quite important for health. Not just that I feel that. There's evidence that we benefit from our own hormones, from having what are called ovulatory cycles or natural menstrual cycles. And so I don't accept that we should, as a population, be shutting that all down. So that's obviously, that's a, that's a big topic. My book then has to, if I make that argument, then I have to provide alternatives for avoiding pregnancy, for treating all these various mm -hmm. hormonal issues. And I'll grant you that the treatment, you know, coming off the pill and trying to find something different 
for endometriosis is probably one of the most challenging ones. So for PCOS, for regular periods, for skin, you know, the solutions are fairly straightforward. For endometriosis, it's a bit different in that the stakes are higher in that it can be a very debil it, not always, but it can be quite a debilitating disease. And yet with my own patients, if they have had symptom relief from the pill, then I don't want them coming off straight away like we would work towards maybe coming off but I don't want to just throw that throw that away if they've actually had some relief from it but just to put it in perspective the hormonal birth control is not a guaranteed symptom relief for endometriosis it's not a cure for one thing absolutely 100% not how could it be when it's a disease of immune dysfunction and really contraceptive drugs just work by shutting down hormones but there was a I think in 2018 or maybe 2016, we can put this in the show notes, there was a Cochrane review who, as you know, are the big evidence-based medicine people of the pill for endometriosis and their results were inconclusive. Basically, the line was something like, there is no clear evidence that the pill relieves endometriosis. Now, I know anecdotally that it does sometimes, so I fully acknowledge that, but it's as I said, I think I said earlier, it's the wrong tool for the job. We're treating an immune disease, inflammatory disease, by shutting down hormones, which in the big picture is not a solution. Mm. It definitely, I mean, getting back to the complexity of endometriosis, I would say it's one of the more difficult multifactorial almost you've got to you got to look at lots of different th things or different yeah. issues to be really successful and put somebody in long-term remission i find um do you find also that there there yeah. might be like an like an autoimmune sort of component um i know that that was one of the uh causes that was uh you know one of the differentials um when i was doing women's health and all that but do you see a lot of that? Okay. Well, that's you've opened opened a can of worms. So <laughs> <laughs> um, it clearly to me is in the territory of autoimmune disease. So apparently that is quite a controversial thing to say, unfortunately. So there's been a bit of it's it's I think everything with endometriosis is just gets ramped, everything just gets dialed up. It's quite because it's quite a serious, can be quite a serious disease. There's a you know, debate about the etiology of it can get quite emotional, quite heated. The, you know, the establishment, at least a few years ago, did not want to hear about an autoimmune etiology. I think, I, I guess for me as a clinician and as a communicator and a writer, I don't, I'm not attached to the word autoimmune because autoimmune can mean lots of different things. I mean, it is without a doubt I would say first and foremost, a disease of immune dysfunction. And most women with endometriosis have the autoimmune haplotype, the kind of celiac, that HLA haplotype. So this is the way I see it. You have to have a certain kind of immune system to ever develop this disease. Like most women, no matter how estrogen dominant they are, whatever they do, they're not going to get endometriosis. Like it's just not... It, there, that's why there's such a strong genetic component. So you have to have that kind of immune system that will do that. Then you have to have probably epigenetic changes on top of that, probably from dioxins. And there's a little bit of evidence, you know, basically, yes, some things that have been alter worsening that situation. Then you have to have the lesions present, which could, I think, occur for different reasons. Then you have to have initiators of the inflammatory process. So whether that's LPS or maybe a nickel allergy in the gut or, you know, other, um, Leah Hechtman, who you may know, another mm -hmm. Sydney mm -hmm. naturopath talks about other microbial initiators. Uh, and by initiators, I don't mean they're the ultimate cause. I mean, there's this immune system that's kind of primed that with the right things in place could go off the rails basically and start creating this inflammatory active inflammatory situation and for you know different women that's going to potentially be different microbes being present and combined with an immune an immune system that doesn't have what it needs so potentially missing some of the key nutrients that an immune system it needs to keep on the rails plus in many cases i would say that's where the autoimmune diet you know, basically gluten 
and casein, those two big that I think of as, you know, drivers of autoimmunity once it's established for endometriosis, usually it requ- treatment usually requires completely eliminating those foods and not just reducing them like you would for FODMAPs or something like that, but like getting them out because they are the kinds of foods that for that haplotype or that immune system, any amount of that is upsetting. So yeah, you can see it's a can of worms. Yes. I guess you can see I'm firmly in the camp where I do think many parts of this looks quite similar to autoimmune disease. There's certainly been review papers about that, trying to decide if it is or if it isn't. I mean, it's very similar to autoimmune disease, put it that way. Okay, so if we're saying, or if if the main theory right now as one of the drivers is the translocation of LPS potentially, yeah. um, is that, are there other microbial influences besides besides that that are affecting the immune system? And so when we're saying immune oh, dysfunction, yeah. what, what other yeah. parts besides LPS causing inflammation, what other immune dysfunction are we seeing? And, and are they microbially related? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, the big answer would be yes. I don't think anyone knows all the different ways potentially that might be playing out, certainly just intestinal permeability generally. Inflammation or inflammatory cytokines originating in the gut. Um, you know, different signals coming from the gut microbes. I suspect it all needs to still be, un, you know, discovered. And and some of your listeners might have more information about this. They could certainly, you know, hopefully chime in in the comments. But yes, I think there's a lot to be done in the gut. A lot. That's why I start in the gut when I'm treating this. <laughs> we always disease. all yeah. we always start with the gut, no matter yeah. what we do as as good naturopaths. I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so you know that's what I've said. I've said this many times to other guests. It's it's so vindicating, isn't it? To to okay. kind of find out that all these years that we've always started with the gut and we didn't really know why, but it worked. Now we're getting the validation through science that that approach has worked not just for um, endometriosis, but for lots of different issues, mood disorders and um, inflammatory conditions and things like that, that, you know, rheum- rheumatic diseases, and et cetera, that the list goes on that we as naturopaths have always treated by approaching uh, it through the gut. And now we know why. Like, there's so much that's coming to light with even just in the field of microbiome um, you know, imbalances that, that are so important to systemic health. I think that that's always been, uh, really, I've always been very, vind- felt very vindicated by that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a word. Yeah. yeah. I heard, um, Alessio, what's the gluten? Fasano. Fasano, yeah. Like years ago, at least quite a few years ago now, giving a lecture he, to, to a net group of naturopaths and mostly we were naturopaths, I guess. And he, just saying, yeah, it's interesting how you somehow intuited like 30 years ago this concept of leaky gut, and now we see that's real. So mm-hmm. yes, I mean, mm-hmm. I think that that does feel it does mm-hmm. feel good to think we've been on the right track with at least some things. I suspect we haven't been doing everything <laughs> perfect. No, and that's you know, I, and I think that there are still so many mysteries. Like to me, yeah. I'm still sort of gobsmacked that yeah. we could have translocation of of. Um, not just bacterial endotoxins, but actual bacteria into the pelvic cavity. I still am sort of gobsmacked by that because, you know, just the same as what we find out now is that the fetus actually has its, has its own, its own microbiome. Like we just are starting to learn that things are not sterile in the human body, (laughs) you know, that we have so much contribution by organisms that we are just starting to understand that in in ways that we never could. But getting back to the microbiome um, and IBS and its driver of endometriosis, so are there particular bacterial patterns perhaps that we could already start to identify on, let's say, a CDSA, like a preponderance of bacteroidetes, for example, or, you know, I'm just guessing. um, Yeah. You know, or, or even as hydrogen sulfide producers, or you know, what do we what do we know so far? I would love to know that myself. I have to be honest with you; I don't do a lot of gut testing to tell me that from my own patients. I suspect there are some patterns there. For what it's worth, I've often, you know, just, just in terms of bigger patterns, I often do see a low stomach acid, which I know obviously can correlate with SIBO and um, and 
some of the classic bloating, you know, bloating patterns of SIBO. I think I said to you at the beginning, I don't do a lot of SIBO testing, which I'm kind of obviously now wishing I had been so I could chime in with some of that. That's okay. You're, you're, you're an, a different type of expert. So we appreciate that. Thank you for listening to the SIBO Doctor podcast. We hope you found the information in this episode useful in the treatment of your SIBO patients. Thanks to our sponsors, SIBOtest.com, a breath testing service with easy online ordering, and Quintron, maker of outstanding breath testing equipment. Tune in again for another episode of the SIBO Doctor podcast. Thanks again for listening.